So good morning. Today we're going to learn about the history of John Wesley and the Methodist Church. Okay? Today's lesson is to understand the organization and the importance that John's, John Wesley's childhood played in making the Methodist religion. Okay? We're going to start about learning John Wesley. And we have to, in order to do that, we have to start with his father, Samuel Wesley. Samuel Wesley was a priest during a very turbulent time in the Anglican English Reformation. Um, does anybody know anything about the English Ref- Reformation in England? Nope. I'm sorry, what was that? So she, she asked if it was anything about um, basically the Reformation with, uh, could you say that again, Diane? Martin Luther. It, so it did have to do with religion. It was basically about the, um, the Protestant and the Catholic uprising. And it started in the 14 and 1500s. Okay, and, and when John Wesley was born in the early 1700s, it was still going on. Okay, so we're in England at this point, and there is uh, not a lot of difference between church and state like there is here in the United States. So whoever was ruling the royals had the big hand in government. Okay. And so there was a huge uprising still about Protestant and, and Catholicism in the government and in the royals. And since um, that was going on, it was also going on in Europe. And I'm sure everybody has just probably heard about the movie Napoleon. And we've all heard a little bit of the history of Napoleon. And so that was going on not just in France. It was also going on in Spain, Germany, and all across Europe. Okay, So when Samuel Wesley was um, a preacher, a pastor, priest, his family, his, parent, his father was also a, a, a pastor. He came from a... a family of such also. And um, it was a very turbulent time in the Anglican church in England. And he uh, faced many enemies in the church and out of the church. Um, Being a son of a priest, Samuel was not good with money. And that followed him all through John Wesley's life and through his marriage. Um, And you'll see as we go through this entire series how that affected um, Samuel and his wife, Susanna, and John and his children. Okay. Um, And so um, changes uh, in Samuel's life affected John. And one of the big changes was Samuel Wesley was not originally named Samuel Wesley. He changed his name and actually how he spelled it, it was West Lee, and he dropped the T um, and made it Wesley. So that was one thing that I found very interesting about it, because that obviously is not what John Wesley's name was. Um, uh, Samuel had a very quick temper, no tact, and he had no business sense, which really affected his children in the long run. So, um, moving on to Susanna. Is there any reason why Samuel changed his name? Was there any reason given? Um, You know, it really sounded like, from everything I read everywhere, that it was more like a status thing for him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a very specific, but it sounded like it was very much a status thing for him. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a, a specific specific, but it sounded like it was status. Um, So uh, John's mother, Susanna, and it it sounded like she was very much um, the body of the home. Um, She was the 25th child in her home. 
She was the baby of the family, and she was also the child of an Anglican priest. Um, Her father was Dr. And I'm hopefully saying this right. Uh, Ansley, who was also struggling with his faith during the Reformation, but was very well to do, and they were very well connected in society. They were connected in multiple different ways, and also said to be connected uh, distantly from royalty. In fact, Susanna um, was very, very uh, intelligent. She was very well read, and she was very well educated, even though she was a female. In fact, so educated that Susanna, at age 12, left the church. She wrote a huge, huge letter of pros and cons as to why she should leave the church during this big um, issue in in the Reformation which upset her father very much greatly and um, was very, very prolific letter um, before she was even 13 years old. And she joined the Church of England, left the Anglican Church and joined the Church of England. This caused a huge rift between her and her father during the political battles between the Church of State the Church of State of England that continued for many years. Um, And this would cause much, much turmoil between Samuel, her husband, and Susanna throughout their years. Um, And so when uh, Susanna's father passed away, all of the living children of Dr. Inslee got very large Um, inheritance but Susanna got nothing and it was she was very hurt by that but it is said in the history books that is probably why Um, so Susanna bore 19 children and out of those children only 10 lived it was very common at the time very large families and the purpose of that obviously was um, so that you could you know have living children Um, The majority of those children um, died at infancy, except for one, and that was the first boy, Sammy, they called him. He was also Samuel. Um, And the funny thing is, is uh, Susanna's father was Samuel, her husband was Samuel, her brother was Samuel. She named her child Samuel, and that's why he was called Sammy. But he did make it to an adult, and I had a hard time finding how old he actually was before he passed, but I do know that he was an adult. Um, And like I said, they called him Sammy. Um, I have a worksheet here, and we don't actually have to do this. It's for fun, but it was the only one I could find that would tell you um, the names of the children that they had and give you a little bit more idea of the children that Susanna raised. Um, Yes, thank you. So, Meta, and I might not say this right, Meta Hedda Bell is nicknamed Hetty. Yes, and Hetty's on the screen right now. That's Hetty in the kitchen with her mom, Susanna. And Susanna is obviously very pregnant there. Okay. So, um, looking at your names here, as you can see, the first two twins there, Ansley and Jebediah, um, there's two sets of twins. 
um, Ansley and Jebediah were accidentally smothered by the by the nanny. I um, it, it reads in the history books that she was um, laying with them, sleeping with them, and accidentally smothered them in their sleep. So, and then obviously the last two twins uh, passed in during the delivery. <coughs> If it says infant, then they weren't even named. They were just bore and passed in during delivery. But because um, the twins, number four and five, they were born, and then they, were, they died after delivery. They were the ones that the, the nanny accidentally smothered. So there was only three boys, as you can see, and then the ten children that uh, Susanna taught. So on the screen, as you can see, Hetty came in crying and said that father had been taken away by the magistrate. Now, for any of you that don't know, magistrate would be like the sheriff, the police in England. Okay. And at this time, Hetty's one of the older children. She was number eight on the list. And Susanna's very pregnant there. And I couldn't tell you, obviously, which, with which child. Um, and Susanna's a very calm, calm personality. Um, she gives her worries to God. She's very firm about this. And the reason we know all this is because um, Susanna, as we had talked about earlier, um, she was very literate. She wrote everything down. And the reason we know all this is because she journaled every day. She sent letters every single day. And so we have tons of stuff on the Wesleys. Um, they, they have a huge library of everything that the Wesleys, everything they can find of the Wesleys that they wrote. They have letters from, from Susanna. They have letters from um, John. They have letters from Charles. They have letters from Samuel. They have journals. They have publications. They obviously have Charles's um, hems and poems because Charles, Charles wrote over 9,000, and he publicized uh, 6,500. Um, so they have a plethora of written materials from the Wesleys, and that's where the history comes from. So at this point in time, um, Hetty rushes into the kitchen, and she's bawling, and she's telling Susanna that... They have taken um, dad away. The magistrate is coming, and they have taken dad away again to the debtor's prison. Now, this family is actually uh, in more upper class because um, Susanna's actually from an aristocrat family, and they are considered more upper class. However, Samuel does not manage money well. He is... Uh, not good with business, he's frivolous, he doesn't think, and he very much does not use money well. And unlike Susanna's father as a priest who makes like six, seven hundred a year, they get 28. Huge difference. So they're at the um, um, rectory in uh, Epworth, the Epworth Rectory, and that's his rectory where he preaches at. And she comes in crying, and Susanna simply says very calm or calmly, it'll be okay, we'll take care of it, God will feed us, don't fear, you know, and sends her out to take care of the other children, and she goes to her prayer chair. Now, I'd like you to look closely at this prayer chair. Do you see the hinges towards the bottom where the, the arms are? So the middle of the top of that 
comes down and it sits right on the arms there. She takes the pillow, the pink thing, right off and she puts it on the floor and she kneels on the floor and right behind where the, um, the, the back of the chair is, it's like a little shelf and that's where her Bible and her pen and everything are. So when she pulls the back down, she grabs her Bible and her pen, or be pencil, quill, and she kneels down on the pillow, on the floor. She always has her apron here. She takes her apron off, and she kneels right there. She covers her head with her apron as she kneels, and she puts her head right down on the back of the, where the arms are, and for one hour a day in the morning and at night, and then when she finds out that Samuel has went to debtor's prison again, and she prays. And the children all know when mom, Susanna, is at her kneeling chair, at her prayer chair is what it's called, they do not interrupt. And she's there twice a day, every single day, for an hour in the morning and an hour at night. That is her time with God. And they are to never interrupt. And it's very, very methodical. They always know that that's going to happen at the same time of the day, every single day. And, and she doesn't fail. Now, Susanna is a very sickly woman. She's, she's sick her entire life. And yet, even though she's sick, she never misses her time. She does the same thing every single day. She feeds the kids at the same time. She goes to prayer at the same time. She dresses the kids at the same time. Everything she does every single day is scheduled and done at the exact same time every single day. So, when John was almost six, not quite six, he was five years old, and in some of the history books it says five, and some of the history books it says six. I had to read a lot of books and encyclopedias to find this out, to get it as correct as possible. So some say five, almost six, and some say six. So I'm going to say almost six. <laughs> um, the, the rectory was started on fire. And some just say it was, it was, there was a fire there. And some say that people were upset with Samuel's behavior and started it on fire. Um, and so there's many accounts of this. Um, they say because of his stern behavior and multiple different things of that nature and that it was set on fire. But anyways, in the middle of the night, the rectory uh, had a fire. And Susan was eight months pregnant. And um, so she just grabbed a child and ran outside. This was the second time that it was set on fire or that it was on fire. And um, Samuel woke the children, grabbed the children, and out they went. Well, when they got outside, they noticed that John was not outside, that he was not there. And Samuel tried to get back into the rectory to get him. And everything was cut off by, by smoke and flames, and he was not able to get out there. So they went back outside and congregated. And Samuel dropped to his knees in prayers. And Susanna huddled with the children, crying, and of course praying also. And they heard yelling. And they noticed that John had climbed up on something in the upper windows, broke a window, and was yelling out the window. And all the neighbors, in, everybody was shocked. They made a human ladder because there was no time for John to, to get out and no time to grab a ladder. So they made a human ladder, and they said, jump, jump. And so he kind of leaped a little bit, and they caught him in their human ladder. 
And they said it was like he was plucked from a brand, which is in Zechariah. It's in the Bible. And then um, his whole life, he thought, wow, plucked from a brand. And his mother said, yes, a, a brand plucked from the burning. His mother said that he must have been made for good things. And so his whole life, he was like thinking, God, God made me for something. I must do something in his brain. That's what he was thinking. But for 13 years, it took to rebuild the rectory. And some of the children were scattered. So this is the rectory. Before, and that is the rectory now. Um, it was uh, wooden the first two fires, and then after the first two fires, they rebuilt it, and that's how it looks now. So you can actually go there now in, in Epworth and uh, take a tour of it, and they have it open so that you can go and see it. There's in actually multiple places in England that you can go and see that have the Wesleys um, there. But because it burned twice and it was wooden, they made it bricks this, the last time. They never redid it to be wooden because of the fires. Um, and it's actually very beautiful. They... Um, they kept the the furniture after the because the the Wesleys moved back in and they lived there a very long time after the the last fire in fact and they have all of their stuff still there it's it's very amazing i took a virtual tour of the the rectory right now it's pretty cool it is it's gorgeous <laughs> it's really neat Makes me proud to be a we <laughs> to be a Methodist. So, but um, one of the problems was because the children were scattered um, for thirteen years, and Susanna was very um, methodical about how she took care of her children and what she did with her children. Um, some of them were not in her care, and she was very um, almost OCD methodical. And so because they weren't with her, they were not making the best choices. They weren't not learning the best manners. They were not learning the best education. And that really, really bothered her because those things suffered. Um, so that leads us uh, to how Susanna taught her children, um, including her daughters, which, if you're familiar with, you know, the 1700s, um, 18th century, girls didn't go to school. It was a very patriarchal society, and ladies didn't go to school. You didn't go to college. You were there to take care of your men. You cooked, you cleaned, and that's how it was. And that's not how it was for Susanna. She was a very educated woman, and she was determined to teach all of her children, including her daughters. So she homeschooled them every day, um, a total of eight hours a day with a lunch break, so six hours and a lunch break. Um, and it was six days a week. So even Saturdays. You got your day of rest to honor the Lord, and that was all you were getting in her household. The rest of the time, you were going to learn Greek, English, French, Latin, philosophy, metaphysics, logic, Bible. And as soon as you could speak, you were taught to pray, pray the Lord's Prayer, memorize scripture, catechism, and then, when you were old enough, the written prayers. And that's from the time you got up, you had, you had a list of everything you were going to do. She was very methodical in the way she taught. You had a, 
You were going to get up. You were going to wash. You were going to get dressed. You were going to eat. You were going to be at the table. And in the kitchen, there was a table. And five on one side, five on the other side. You were going to sit in the same spot. This is, and, and that's the way it was. She had the chalkboard, and, and you learned there, and that's where you stayed. And she had a list of rules. And, and we're going to talk about that next. She had 16 house rules which to live by. And this is very, very important because without understanding uh, how Susanna taught her children and how that affected her children, um, you can't understand how John lived his life because John and his mother were extremely close. All throughout John's life, in his letters with his mom and the correspondence with his mom back to John, he, he would question things in his life and he would, he would send letters to his mom. And his mom would send letters back to his, his, her son, John, you know, and um, answer with scripture to John. So if he had a, a question about anything, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't Samuel always that he would go to. It was his mom. And she would answer him with prayer and scripture when he was having a hard time with things. Um, so he really, really trusted and honored his mother. So, so Susanna Wesley's 16 Rules of Parenthood. First, number one. Eating between meals is not allowed. No snacks. Two, as children, they are to be in bed by 8 p.m. I don't think all of our children would like some of these rules. Three, they are required to take medicine without complaining. Four, subdue self-will in a child and those working together with God to save a child's soul. What do you think about that? I, I don't think the kids would like some of these. Five, to teach a child to pray as soon as he can speak. And we kind of talked about that earlier. As soon as they could speak, they had to learn the Lord's Prayer. Six, require all to be still during family worship. To be still, not just talk, to be still. Seven, give them nothing they can they cry for and only that when they asked for politely now think about that give them nothing that they cry for and only that when they asked for politely so many days now that in schools and stuff they bribe the kids just to make good choices think about that If you make a good choice, I'll give you this. Eight, to prevent lying, punish no fault, which is first confessed and repented of. Nine, never allow a sinful act to go unpunished. Ten, Never punish a child twice for a single offense. 11. Comment and reward good behavior. I do this often because I always say walk in feet, walk in feet because they're running. You never say stop running 
I always say, walk in feet, walk in feet. And then when I see him doing that, I like to say, oh, I like those walking feet. Right? 12. Any attempt to please, even if poorly performed, should be commended. What was that, Diane? <laughs> Burnt toast and cold coffee. <laughs> hey, anything. Children are talking about yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirteen. Preserve property rights even in smallest manners. Matters. Fourteen. Strictly observe all promises. Yeah, don't break your promises. Kids do not understand those things. Fifteen, require no daughter to work before she can read well. Sixteen, treat children to fear the rod. What's it say in the Bible? Spare the rod, spoil the child. Any comments on that? Thoughts? Pretty good rules, right? We get a lot of these things in our home, you know, as far as rewarding the behavior and making them change um, from demanding something to asking politely for it. Um, there were a lot of similarities. Um, so I don't think some of them are kind of out there a little bit, but. I think that, that they're a good basis or a good place to start. You know, and we're a good base, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Number seven, what's the magic word for polite? In yes, please. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you have to remember what society was like at that point. I mean, for her to say, teach your daughters, that was <coughs> not the norm. Exactly. Right. So, Right. So she also did something very unique. So she had 10 children, and every single week she would set aside one hour for every single child to listen to them and give them comfort. And then if they had something that she could guide them with, she did. Every single child, one hour, every single week. She journaled daily and taught her children to do so also. She taught them to write letters to each other and to others that they loved. She sent her children letters their whole lives. And later on, as we talked about, her letters, journals, and publications were all kept. And that's how we have all the inf um, information that we do have. Everything the children did was on a daily schedule and in a timely fashion. There was a method to Susanna's schedule, her daily schedule, her weekly schedule, and her monthly schedule. Never fail. She was methodical in everything she did because she had so many children and she did not get much assistance from Samuel. He was not there. He went to London very often for his, his business stuff um, and he truly stayed out of children affairs and household affairs. Um, and was not, um, their marriage was not a, an inclusive thing. He was not, they were, uh, as far as marriages go, theirs was not a good marriage. And therefore, with their children, um, except for Charles Wesley, none of the ten children had good marriages. None of them. 
very much in all the documentation I read, all the books I read, not one of the children had a good marriage except Charles and his wife. Susanna was definitely a single parent, pretty much. Um, and when Samuel was around, the children um, really didn't go to him for much at all. He, um, there was only a few times in any of the books where it talked about him guiding and stuff. And we'll talk about that later in um, different series um, when he did guide um, John. And that was more in religious uh, segments and things when John was in his uh, pastoral things. And they kind of did more of this anyways because John split away from the Anglican church, um, obviously. So, okay, so... Oop, wrong direction. So on, dis on discipline, um, Susanna Wesley believed that for a child to grow into self-discipline and a self-disciplined adult, that he or she must be a, a self-disciplined child. To her, the stubborn flesh was the hardest battle for cr Christians to fight, and godly parents would do well to equip their child to overcome it early, which, as we know, if they don't have self-discipline and self-respect for themselves and their parents, they probably won't have it as an adult, which I can't really read that quote from here, but that's basically what that says, if I remember correctly. Yep, the child that learns to obey his parents in the home will that doesn't learn to, yeah, will not obey God or man out of the home. And she was very firm in that. And that's part of the reason why I believe that she was so firm in everything that she uh, did. Yes, the child that never learns to obey his parents in the home will not obey God or man out of the home. Another one of her most famous quotes is, help me, Lord, to remember that religion is not to be confined to the church, nor exercise only in prayer and meditation, but that everywhere I am in thy presence. And she wanted her kids to learn this and live this. So, Charles went to London once, to uh, help a friend um, who was being uh, tried for heresy. And he hired a curate to take over the rectory while he was gone. Well, the curate really wanted his job. And so he kept doing sermons on debts because, uh, excuse me, Samuel. So because Samuel had obviously a huge issue with debts. So... Um, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I, I'm in, I think it is what the curate's name was. Um, and so he kept doing sermons on debts and how you should be better at taking care of your debts, etc. And Susan, she wasn't so much irritated by that. She was more irritated by the fact that if you're going to be taking care of God's children and their hearts and spirituality, that you should really be focused on the Bible and spreading God's word and seed. So he would do the sermons on Sunday morning, and she said, well, my children need to hear about God. And so she did, she took the book of sermons, and she'd open it up on Sunday in the kitchen, and she invited the servants and all of her children, and the servants said, well, can my families come? And so the servants families came, and she would read out of the book of sermons and do prayers and everything in the, in the church kitchen, and Samuel was gone very, very many weeks, and the curate got upset because gradually every single Sunday evening while he was gone, more people came and more people came to the rectory kitchen to listen to Susanna. And there was more people in the kitchen of the rectory listening to Susanna than there were on Sunday morning, listening to the curate that was replacing Samuel. And so the curate, 
uh, wrote to Samuel and said, do you know what your wife is doing? This can't happen. She's a woman. And, of course, Samuel wrote back and said, Susanna, should you be doing this? And Susanna wrote back, very kindly, because she was very intelligent. If you do, after all, think to dissolve this assembly, do not tell me that you desire me to do it, for that will not satisfy my conscience. But send me your positive command in such a full and express terms as you may absolve me from all guilt and punishment for neglecting this opportunity of doing good. When you and I shall appear before the great and awful tribunal, tribunal of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Samuel talked to the curate, wrote to the curate, and of course Susanna. And the kitchen sermons continued. So, yes. So Samuel. When you're knocking at the door. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. And she's saying, you know, we're shaking in our boots here, and I'm not going to make a mistake here. Tell me. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can stand before Yeah. Yeah. You, you want that wrath? I don't want that wrath. Yeah. Tom. I think the Right. And that's what she was saying. Because you read, there's many, many accounts of this in, like, almost every single book ever about the Wesleys, this talks about it. Um, and in fact, I might actually, no, I don't have another slide of it. But this, this is talked about, like this is over talked about. Um, and, and she's very, she goes on in, in another letter, um, and I can't remember who she's talking to. But there's other accounts similar because I think maybe I'm in, um, the curate is discussing this too um, because of the letter probably from Samuel to him. Um, and I would love to read that letter. I would really love to read that letter. But um, so obviously she's, she's schmoozing, schmoozing him for lack of another term saying, you know, I'm going to stand before God. You're going to stand with me. We have to think about what's in the best interest of Christ-like. We have to, we're Christ-like followers, right? And that's what we're looking at, right? It's not about us. Right. It's not about people. It's about, right, what would Christ do? <laughs> yeah. So, um, and so the, so it continued until Samuel came home from London. Um, yes, neither Samuel or the curate, I man, challenged her further. So, at age 10... John Wesley went to the Charter House to further his education in London. Um, the Duke of Buckingham nominated John as Samuel won an agreement from him for a scholarship. So obviously that's a boarding house, and um, the Wesleys could not afford to send him. They obviously at 28 pounds a year could not afford that kind of a education. But somehow... Samuel had uh, gotten the Duke of Buckingham to nominate John for a scholarship. So he went to the 
um, charter house, which wasn't super prestigious, but it was, you know, a very nice uh, education for John. And he went there for six years to be educated. And he was a very strong student, very studious. Um, and at the charter house, there we go, at the charter house, um, they had a hazing process there. Now, John was only five foot three, and he was very petite. He's a very small man, um, and obviously a very smaller, much smaller child. Um, so he had a very, very small stature. And at the charter house, they had a, a food hazing process that they went through. And the bigger kids would take your food. So he basically lived on bread and water the majority of the time that he was there. Um, and his father had told him before he left and reminded him all through his years there to run every single morning, three times each morning, and to stay strong and active. And Wesley obeyed him and later wrote that together that the exercise and the limited diet contributed to his study and his sturdy constitution as an adult. So they had a beautiful garden at the charter house, and Wesley would go outside every single morning, and he would run all the way around the garden three times every single day. And then later on, um, if you read in the books, he had, when he built his house later on, in his house, he had this gorgeous, gorgeous window that faced the sun. And in this window, he had built, um, it, it came up a little bit more like this along the entire window. And he would not sit to write any of his letters or his sermons. He, he had a shelf like this. And it sat in the window, and there was, and it sat just like this. And he would always stand; he would never sit. And that's how he wrote all of his sermons and his letters and everything. He would not sit because he was taught that that was not good for him, and for his body. So he wrote everything out on the shelf in his house when he had his house, or his actually his room in his in his um, rectory built. His room had this beautiful shelf. So, because that's what was good for his constitution. Question. Yes. Going back to what mm -hmm. age he was 10 when he went. He finished at 16. And then after... Um, at age 17, he was admitted to Christ Church in Oxford. So he spent six years at the Charter House. In London. He was at the Charter House from 1714 to 1720. And when he left, he said, the world is my parish. Is that a quote of Christmas? Yep. Okay, I know, but I'm just thinking of the age, the 10 to 16. Did he quote that while he was at Charter House, or did that come later? That came later. Okay. It came later. So again, at age 17, John Wesley was admitted to the Christ Church, Oxford, in the year 1720. And we will begin that and learn about the Holy Club next week. It's Lincoln. Yes. It's Lincoln. No. He actually goes to Lincoln College, which is part of Oxford. Okay. 
which you already know. <laughs> We're going to get into that more next week. Yes, I learned a bunch. We went over our time this week, but we started late. So we do have a little bit. <laughs> we do have, um, and I don't know because I didn't look at the questionnaire. Did we answer everything on the study guide? Does anybody have any questions? So I'd like to just briefly go over a little bit about Susanna and why Susanna was a little so important because we're periodically going to discuss um, minute points about Susanna all through this series. Um, John was super, super close with his mom. And as we discussed, periodically throughout his entire lifetime, he contacts his mother um, when things come up. Not just be, when things come up, but throughout his lifetime, he contacts his mother, and he uh, actually she lives where he's at later on in life, um, and she is his his great guiding light all through his life. Um, he is very close with his mom. Um, John uses everything that his mother taught him all through her, all through his life, his organizational skills his scheduling, everything he learned from his mother, he uses through his entire life. And, there, and the reason this is so important is all of those scheduling and organizational methods take him through his life, the perseverance and the, and the turbulence that he finds in his challenges in his life are all, are all um, not fixed, but he works through with those skills that he learned through his mother. And without those skills that he has learned with his mother and his education with his mother, um, John Wesley's life would have been a very different thing. All of the skills that his mom gave him are used his entire life. And that same, the same thing goes for his brother Charles, which are the two very, very um, big Wesley people in our church. And there would be no Methodist church without John Wesley. So, any questions I can answer before we decide to end the... Usually there's so many more questions. I just, was I that thorough? Nothing at all? All right. Well, next week, again, we'll start off at his um, beginning of his undergraduate school at uh, Lincoln College, Oxford, where he begins his undergrad, which would be your bachelor's degree, for anybody that doesn't understand that. And we'll discuss what he's going to learn and um, what happens there, which really does have another great impact in his life. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me, and I hope... I hope we can um, continue this, and let's um, leave off with some prayer, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for joining us today and opening our lives to learning more about our founder, John Wesley. Lord, I, I thank you so much for giving us this information. Lord, please guide us in our week. Walk with us through this cold. Keep us safe. And Lord, I just... Oh, I just love that you are with us today, and I just, I just thank you for this wonderful service we had today. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. In the name of your holy, precious Son, amen.